Okay, it's good to see all of you. Um, hope you're. Uh, I you know the this sand this Sunday for me is also the most challenging Sunday because all of us we lose an hour. I don't know why our government does it. You know, we have a couple of states you know that don't practice daylight saving time. I think Hawaii and Arizona. You know, because I have a friend that lives there. And, um, you know, they've got the right idea. I don't know why we, do, we keep on doing this. But good to see all of you here. You know, I have about 10 clocks I have to reset every morning. I know, right? You guys do that? And then you're going to you know, try and get your bodies together. Okay, great. Um, it's good to, uh, good to see all you here. Uh, just a couple of things just want to remind you of before you get into the message. Um, I want to, really want to encourage you this year... Uh, regarding the mission conference uh, because what Pastor ben Benjamin has done and this is especially for the English is uh, this year we have uh, we're going to have separate Mandarin track or, or Man and then separate English track so we've actually he's gone through the effort to get an excellent uh, mission speaker um, I haven't heard him myself but my son Wesley heard him um, Tony he's a missionary in Southeast Asia and uh, to, uh, he heard Tony speak at the CMC conference in December and all. So he'll be coming. So it's Friday night. He'll be here. The, the session's in. And on Sunday, there'll be two sessions in here. So our, our, our worship service will be here. And then the second hour, we won't have Sunday school. We'll join the 1.5. It'll be here. Okay, so uh, I want to encourage you to come to all the sessions and all. It'll be a great time of learning and encouragement. Um, just one other thing, just want to ask you, uh, just to pray for me, um, starting tonight till Tuesday, I'm um, needing to take some personal time just to do a personal retreat and go seek the Lord, so I'm going to be going down uh, to Oceanside. I, I found, I found a, a monastery retreat center that I'm going to go, and you know, just to have some time just to pray, read the word, and just reflect and get refreshed. Um, my daughter Victoria was asking me a lot of questions last night, you know, what, what, what I was going to do, where I was going, and she was asking, like, are you going to become a monk now because you're going to a monastery? I said, I said no, no, I'm just going to go down and, you know, to a place there and just have a personal retreat. So if you could remember to pray for me, because um, I do want to just find some refreshment and hear from the Lord. Okay, if you have a Bible, please open up to the book of um, uh, 1 Samuel. The book of First Samuel. First Samuel, I'm going to read reading from the uh, New International Version. You know, if you have an outline, uh, you can follow along in that also. First Samuel 18, verse 1 through 4. After David had finished talking with Saul, Jonathan became one in spirit with David, and he loved him as he as himself. From that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Jonathan took off his robe he was wearing and gave it to David along with his tunic and even his sword, his bow, and his belt. May God bless the reading of his word. You join me in prayer. God, we thank you this morning that we can be here, that we can be here to worship you, that we can um, hear from your word. I ask that this morning, God, that you would speak to us. Um, I make myself available to be your messenger. Lord, I ask that each one of us would be attentive in our hearing to hear your word. God, that you would open up our eyes to give us spiritual insight. Lord, that our minds would be clear so that we could understand. And Lord, that our hearts would be teachable to respond. And finally, I ask for the empowerment through your Holy Spirit to speak your word clearly and effectively. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Well, this morning I want to talk with you and, and share with you. I want to continue on uh, the theme of last week. Remember I talked about uh, being, a, uh, being a true friend and what's involved with that. And um, I felt that it was important to continue on this theme and go a, little, go a little bit deeper. And one of the stories that we see in the Bible that is very uh, um, kind of noteworthy in regards to uh, friendship is that of uh, the friendship of David and Jonathan. 
And uh, as, as I'm thinking about sharing that about that, I want to share with you why this is important to me. Because, you know, in regards to friendship and having friends, um, I kind of learned about the importance of friendship when I was in um, middle school, or back then we called it junior high. And when I was in um, junior high, there, there were I had there were uh, there were four of us that were, were were buddies that we hang out together. I had a friend named Mike, and there were two other friends. And I was very close to Mike. Mike was a a great friend. You know, one of the things was uh, why he was a good friend is because he had a house that had a pool. And so during the summer times, you know, I would go there, and it'd be great because he would invite me and my other friends over and we'd go swimming and that, and that was that was fun and sometimes he, I, I remember he would you know invite invite me to kind of hang out for dinner or whatever with his family um, Mike was a very smart guy he he was one of these uh, math whizzes and all I remember I was in the math team with him in in middle school and I'd kind of have to work hard to kind of do the problem but he would just like you know just whip it off and then yeah he'd get the solution and all he's a really smart guy um, he was also a musician he played trombone I remember one time he was going to do a piece and I accompanied him on, on the piano the best I could and you know, I was really struggling and so I had this friendship with him but uh, there was something that happened with this friendship is somewhere around uh, my second or third year in um, middle school things changed and it wasn't that I changed, but what happened is that my two other friends, somehow, looking back on it now, I think somehow they, they got jealous of Mike. Because Mike was a really smart guy. You know, he's the kind of guy that you look at and go, wow, he's, he's smart here. I'd like to be like him. Not like, you know, that was before Michael Jordan, like, I want to be like Mike anyways. But, you know, they started saying things about Mike. Like they said, oh, Mike's like a teacher's pet. And they started to say other things. And at that time, you know, I wasn't mature enough to kind of know what to do or know what to say. But for me, you know, being the, the young guy that I was, I, I bowed in the peer pressure. And so there were two of my friends that were against Mike. So I, I said, well, there's two and there's one here. And I didn't have a backbone to stand up for Mike. So I went along with them. I began to listen to what they, they, they said, and I just began to kind of give them the cold shoulder. And it was sad because, you know, Mike began, became hurt, and then even got to the point where his mom, because I knew his mom, you know, family had go to the house for swimming and all. His mom was quite upset because she didn't understand why, how, how all of a sudden I had been friends with them all this time and then got to a point where I wasn't friends with them. Oh, I was also going to explain that. I was also in Boy Scouts together. So Mike and I were also on the same Boy Scout troop. And we did stuff together. And um, actually what I ended up doing is I ended up betraying my friend. You know, kind of destroying the friendship because I bowed to peer pressure. And, you know, that, that, that hurt me actually in some ways. And... When I, when I come and I look at the story of Jonathan, because this is a story about someone who is committed, a true friend to the end. Actually, at that point, I didn't really know Jesus, but I vowed in my heart, I said, you know what? I don't want to ever do that again. I don't want to ever have that happen in my life. Because it's something that, even to this day, is kind of painful to me because of what I did to my friend. And this morning, what I want to do is, is look at the example here of Jonathan and David, because here, to me, this is instruction and guidance of how to be a true friend, how to be a, a friend to the end, a friend that would not bow to peer pressure, a friend that would not, you know, betray, um, betray friendship. And so if we're looking here at the scripture, I want to start off here by looking at the commitment of a friend. So we've got point number one here. Now... What we see here is we see in the scripture, as we see in 1 Samuel 18, we see that David had finished talking with Saul, and Jonathan became one in spirit with him, and he loved him as himself. And then from that day, Saul kept David with him and did not let him return to his father's house. And it says here in verse 3, and Jonathan made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now I want to look at this first part as we start here in the story, because the whole story here about from 
that you read in, uh, in, the, in the Old Testament about Jonathan and David. It actually starts in 1 Samuel 17 where we have the story of David and Goliath and it goes all the way to I think around uh, chapter 25 where we see them interacting what's going on with David. But we see that Jonathan, okay, he um, makes this covenant with David and it says he loved him as himself. Now we see that there's this bond that forms between these two men. But we have to understand what happens before. Give you a little bit of a background story. Some of you are very familiar with it. Is that um, actually David had some contact with Saul, who's um, Jonathan's father. Okay, Jonathan is the son of, of Saul. And Saul was troubled by, by a spirit. And so David was a court musician there. And then... What we get to at this point in the story is that the, uh, the Israelites are in a, a battle against their arch enemies, the Philistines. And so what happens is that they're in this place called the Valley of Elah. And what happens is that the battle gets to, they, they get to a place where it's kind of like a stalemate. Okay? Both of them have strong forces, but both of them are fearful that they, won't, they don't want to go into battle. So what they would do in those days is that sometimes if you got to a stalemate, what you would do is they say, okay, you know what, this is how we'll solve the problem. It's going to be like, you know, a soccer, you know, in the soccer you have like a kind of kick off, you know, to see, you know, who's going to, who's going to win. So in those days what they said, okay, you pick one champion, we'll pick one champion, we'll have them both represent us and battle to the death. And whoever's champion wins, okay, you know, we, we're, that means that the rest of you surrender. So what happens Okay, as you know, the Philistines have a ringer, okay? They have this guy, Goliath. And Goliath is, is about nine foot, you know, tall. Okay, he's got a, his armor weighs about 125 pounds. He's got a spear there. The head of the spear is 15 pounds. Okay, and he's, he's been someone who's been trained just for warfare. And so he comes out every day for 40 days. He comes out and he taunts the the armies of, of uh, Israel, you know, say, okay, you know, you guys are so strong, you have to believe in a God that's going to defeat me, you know, bring him out. And everyone's just shaking in their armor, right? No one's going to go out. But they, David, he comes on the scene, he's got to take some food to his brothers who are out there, he's the youngest. And so, as you know, he goes out there, and then he looks and he sees um, Goliath, and he says, well, who's this uncircumcised guy, you know, who's defying the armies of God. And so when he's talking about someone who's uncircumcised, he's, he's, it's like a, it's an insult to him. It's like, hey man, you know, who's this guy? You know, he's a dirty guy. He's someone that doesn't know God. And he's defying. Now, yeah, the one thing that you see about David is that you see in David's conversation and, and statements, he's always referring to the Lord. He says, he's defying not just us, Israel. He's defying God. Which that's what, that's what um, Goliath was doing. He, would, he was cursing, he, as you see in the battle, he curses the God of Israel. And so, you know, David describes his strength to, you know, he comes up to Saul and Saul doesn't know who he is. Probably likely that, because um, people say, well, wouldn't he recognize him before because he used to be a musician in his court? And it could have been that timeline that the time where David was a musician for him and the time that he appears now could have been that David was younger. But so David talks about the times that, you know, he had defeated a lion or defeated a, a bear that was trying to uh, uh, take some of his father's sheep from the flocks. Okay? And so, you know, he, he talks about his, his strength and his ability. Now the thing is, when understanding this is that all, the, all this time is that Jonathan, Jonathan is Saul's son, so he would probably be there right next to Saul. So he was hearing all these things about um, David and what David had done, what David had accomplished. And so, and then finally here, as you see the scene, comes to the big battle, right? And so... As you know, David has a sling. He's, he's kind of got a stealth strategy. A stealth strategy. Because here, Goliath, he's like, he's like the guy in the tank and everything like that. He's got all the armor. He's got everything all set up. Okay? And David's just running around and all he's got is like a little stinger missile. Okay? But he's going to take him out. Because what he does is that he goes there and so David's actually secret weapon is this sling. 
Now it says that he went to the Valley of Elah. Actually, I went there when I was in the tour of Israel. And it kind of looks like this. So you see the picture here? Got the idea that there's the Philistine army on the left side and side. The Israelites are there. The valley is just this flat, open place there. And uh, there is a river that's there. Um, and it says that David picked up five you know, smooth stones. And kind of think about this. Okay, when you think about stones, it's not like a pebble. He's probably picking up a stone that's like the size of a baseball. Size of a baseball. Okay. And so, so it says that, um, you know, um, so, so what he does is when he goes up into the battle and, and all, you know, Goliath there is charging him. Okay, he's used to fighting some guy man on man there, you know, armor to armor. And so David comes out with his secret weapon and he's swinging. And, and so he, what he does is actually runs up closer. Okay, so he's actually, this is opposite what you think someone would do. He's running up closer to him. And then he says, you know, I'm, I'm coming against you in the name of the Lord. And he's swinging this uh, baseball-sized rock, you know, have to imagine. And then he's got good accuracy, so, because when, when, he, when he lets go of it, it hits David, oh uh, no, hits Goliath right in the forehead. Okay? So you imagine, you know, nowadays modern baseball players, they wear a helmet, sometimes they'll get a cushion just being hit with a regular baseball. So can you imagine the speed of getting hit by a, a rock? Traveling at the same speed there with a slingshot, okay, would definitely knock you out. So he's got knocked out, and then, you know, he's, he's killed by that blow, and then David cuts off his head. So what we see is that Jonathan is a witness here to David. He hears David talk about his faith in God, sees his courage, and then sees him, you know, win the biggest battle ever against this giant. And so what it says here is that then Jonathan, he, made, he, he talked with him after the battle and he made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now I think the one thing that you want to see is that what Jonathan is seeing is that here's a man, here's a man that has courage. Here's a strong man. Here's, a, here's someone though that has faith in God. Someone that believes in God and puts his life on the line there. So Jonathan is drawn to that kind of person. That's what the friendship is. So, so sometimes when you look at friendship and what the bond is and, and what the commitment is, I'd say for us that are followers of Christ, is that one of the things that you want to say, if you want to have a commitment, you know, strong friendship with someone, find someone who is walking with the Lord also. Find someone who is walking with the Lord. Not just a Christian, but someone walking with the Lord and believing in the Lord. Because in life now or in the future, your friends that are following the Lord will either help you, pull you up, or they will pull you down. I mean, even for me, I, I feel like, oh, hey, I'm a strong believer. You know, I'm following the Lord for many years. But I'm not strong all the time. And, and it's kind of foolish for me to think that, hey, I'm strong enough that all my friends, I'm going to pull them up. I'm going to pull them up spiritually to where I'm at. Sometimes I need people in my life that are ahead of me in the Lord, that can pull me up. Because sometimes I'm weak, I lose faith. And what we see here is that it says, Jonathan, he made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself. Now here what we look at, this is a commitment of friendship. So go on, um, let's see. Now it says that he made a covenant with him. Now understanding this, in those days, okay, the, the word covenant, in the Hebrew it's the word berit, okay? And that word covenant, you, you see that many times in the Bible. You see that actually with the call of um, Abraham. Okay, God makes a covenant with Abraham. Actually, in, in, in that story, you see that God puts Abraham into this uh, uh, deep sleep. And then what, no, no, what, what God tells him first is that he takes these animals and he cuts them in half. And he, and he lays both sides out on this, uh, you know, on the ground. And um, what, it, what it says is that um, then he falls into this deep sleep and then he sees a vision of the smoking pot going through between these two animals that are cut. Now you have to imagine if there were two animals cut here, several of them, there'd be like this bloody river in the middle. And um, the idea of covenant... Is, is literally, the, the word, when we talk about covenant, it literally means to cut a covenant. So when people were making a, seri uh, you know, 
a main covenant would be that you take an animal, you sacrifice it, you have blood there, and then the two parties would walk through this blood. And the idea and concept of the covenant was that if either of us breaks this agreement, let what is done to these animals be done to me. Does that make sense? You guys with me? And so what, when God makes this covenant with Abraham, if you, if you, okay, we're talking about that in the Old Testament. When he makes that covenant, what God does is that God says he's the only one that goes through that. Now I want you to understand this because when we talk about having a covenant and relationship with God, that's what God's friendship is with us. You know, we sing about I'm a friend of God. God keeps his covenant. God says no matter what you do, what your attitude is, whatever your behavior is, I am committed to you. I will love you now and to eternity, regardless. Because God, with the covenant with Abraham, he says, I'm the only one going through. He says, I know, Abraham, you will not be able to fulfill this covenant. You're not going to be able to do it on your own. There's got to be blood that's going to be shed to keep that covenant. So moving ahead, okay, so when we talk about Jesus on the cross... Remember, we take the, last, uh, the Lord's Supper, and Jesus said, this, is, this cup is my blood. I'm making a covenant with you. Okay? Jesus is reminding them of that covenant that God made. He says, I'm making this commitment to you. I'm going to shed my blood. My blood is going to be this blood of this covenant that I'm going to be committed to you no matter what. No matter what you do. Now, this is another reminder here. As long as I'm talking about covenant... Because when we talk, um, another thing for us when we talk about covenant is also in marriage. Because when we talk about marriage, when the Bible talks about marriage, it says that marriage is a covenant relationship. It's not a contract. Okay, that's why I like the traditional vows. You know, it says when you get married, it says, you know, marry you in richer or purer, you know, sickness and health. And the last part is till death do us part. The reason that's in there is because uh, um, in the traditional vows, people understand that that's what it means. Covenant means literally till death. Okay. Um, you know, sometimes I've had struggle with my wife. I said, well, okay, well, maybe murder, maybe, but no, okay, no divorce. Okay. But, but, but the idea is that you're committed to that relationship. Till death do you part. That's what you says, that's what it means to make a covenant. And so it says he loved him as he loved himself. Now when you look at that, I have to, make a, uh, I have to insert something here because nowadays there, there are people that will look at this and they say, oh, the, the love between David and Jonathan, okay? You know, <clears throat> that was two men loving each other, okay? You know, lo loving each other, you know, like as people talk about um, homosexual relationships today. Now, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about that at all. Because we see, you know, David, David was someone that he was married, had to, um... But what it's talking about here is talking about when he says he loved him as he loved himself. Actually, in the scripture, when it talks about loving your neighbor, it says, love your neighbor as yourself. The second greatest commandment that Jesus gave, you know, Matthew 22, you know, 30, 38. You know, he talks about, you know, loving the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And then the second is the greatest, and then the second is love your neighbor as yourself. So when he's talking about this, is that, you know, Jonathan is loving him as he would love himself, caring for them, being committed to him as he would for himself. So, you know, just one other thing, just kind of remind you, what, what, what does this covenant relationship look like? What does a commitment look like? Okay, so... Imagine for a moment, we've got these two friends here. This is Jonathan and David, you know, okay, or, or you with your friends, okay? Say, hey, you know, we, we want to be committed. We're going to make a covenant relationship with each other. What's, what's it really look like, okay? So for me, the best thing in life, if something's broken, duct tape, duct tape solves a multitude of things, okay? <laughs> so the idea and in, 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 and all, when you talk about covenant and being committed to people, it's like, it's like duct tape here, okay? And like, here, let's see if this works. It's like, it's like being duct taped together, okay? Right. Okay, here we go. Okay. So the idea and concept here is what, what, 
okay? What duct tape has joined together, let no one pull asunder, okay? Okay, so the idea is that here, okay? Now, with duct tape, okay, you're committed. You're stuck together, okay? I mean, you, 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 you can pull this apart, but it, will, it, it might cause some damage. But that's what it means. That's what the commitment is. So that's what Jonathan says. Hey, man, I'm committed to you. I'm duct taped to you. So the next thing that we see is that as we're going along in this friendship, so we see this commitment in this covenant. Next thing that we see is that there is... Okay, Oh, the next slide here. I just want to share with this other thing. In regards to the commitment that David made, uh, that Jonathan made with David, it says that also, it says he took off his robe, he was wearing, he gave it to David along with his tunic, even his sword, his belt, his bow, and his belt. Now, what, what, what we're seeing here is that David, the, uh, for Jonathan, the robe represented his royal position. He was a son of the king, so he was the next in line to be the ruler. Okay? And uh, the same thing is with his, his sword, his boat, uh, bow and a belt. These are just symbols of his office. And what Jonathan was seeing and recognizing is that, hey, even though me, I, I, I should be the next king, he actually recognized, he saw something that, the anointing of God and the choosing of God that, hey, David, you, you're the one that should be the next king. You should be the one that be the next king. Remember, his dad, Saul, was chosen as king, but his dad, Saul, did not really have a faith, a strong faith in God. No, he wasn't centered on God. So this is the other thing that we've seen that he did in his friendship, is that he, he recognized, hey, you are going to be greater than I. I'm committed to your success. So the next thing we see is that the protection of a friend, the protection of a friend... As we go on the story, we, we can't go through all the details, but I encourage you to read that, is that uh, there are several times where, where David, after this, he's taken in the household of Saul, but then uh, what happens as it goes along that um, Saul is troubled by a spirit, and he tries to kill David. Okay, this is 1 Samuel 18. Um, then later on, you know, uh, David's becoming more successful, and there, uh, he sends them out on missions. And da whatever David does, he's successful in killing the Philistines. And so people start singing about David, how, you know, Saul has only killed thousands, but David has become, uh, killed tens of thousands. And so Saul offers um, David his, his daughter, uh, Michal, and, um, for the price of a uh, hundred Philistine foreskins. Okay, it's kind of gross, but that's kind of the way that they kind of collect his scalps at that time. So he sends out David to do that, and he's hoping, well, David's going to do that. You know, he, he, no way he's going to defeat 100 Philistines, and he'll probably get killed in the process, but David is successful. And then in 1 Samuel 19, we see that uh, actually Saul tells Jonathan and his servants, he says, hey, if you get, if, if you get David, kill him. So there's a... Uh, contract out on David's head. And so uh, in 1 Samuel 19, uh, Jonathan speaks kindly of David before Saul. And now Saul takes an oath and he tells him, hey, I'm not going to kill you. And so David's back again in the household there. And then a second time, um, Saul tries to spear him. Okay, so there's twice that he's, you know, imagine that you're at your workplace and all and you're your, your manager go, kind of goes postal and tries to shoot you one time and you're going like, oh my goodness, I'm going to stay away from this guy. And then you go, and then the guy said, no, no, everything's okay, I was just having a bad hair day or something like that. And, and then you go back an, another time and then the guy comes out, and pulls out a gun again, you're going like, hey, 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 there's something wrong with this picture. Okay, I better stay away from this guy. This guy's dangerous, not, health, not good for my health. Okay. So Saul tries to spear David again and then he sends people to his house to try and get him, try and kill him. And then his wife um, sets up a decoy there, gets an idol, a statue, puts some goat on hair on there, puts it to look like he's in bed and David escapes out the window. So th then finally, so when, when, um, when we read this passage is that um, David is, is talking to Jonathan and, and he's... Uh, 
visibly upset and shaken. And he's trying to figure out what's going on. He says, what have I done? What's my crime? It's 1 Samuel 21. He says, how have I wronged your father? Why is he trying to take my life? Okay. Now Jonathan says, you're not going to die. Look, my father does not do anything great or small without confiding on me. Why would he hide this from me? It's not so. Okay, so David took an oath. He said, your father knows very well that I found favor in your eyes. And he has said to himself, Jonathan will not know this or he will be grieved. Yeah, sure, the Lord lives and you live. There's only one step between me and death. Jonathan said to David, whatever you want me to do, I'll do it for you. So David's saying, look at here. I'm literally only one step away from death. Because it says a couple times he was there. And he said he avoided him. Pretty much like he probably stepped to the side before the spear went whizzing by his head. And so he's in danger. And so he's telling John. And Jonathan said, okay, whatever you do, I, I will be your, I'm your friend. I'm going to protect you. And so he tells him, okay, there's going to be a, this uh, festival that, that will happen. And I'm going to be absent from the dinner. And you tell, tell, uh, tell your father that I've gone to go be with my family to do some, uh, do some sacrifices and see what he does. He says, well, if he's kind toward me, he won't be upset. But if he gets angry, then I know that his heart is set against me. And so, so this is what we see is that um, as, you, as you move further on in the story, you know, um, we see that they're having dinner their first night. David's not there. So Saul's thinking, oh, okay, you know, David, he's like unclean. He's not going to be there. Then the second, second day, he's not there. And then Jonathan tells him the story. Oh, you know, David asked permission to go with his family. Saul gets very angry. And Saul, gets, Saul throws a spear at Jonathan. Okay, then he realizes, hey, this is, not, this is not going well. It's bad news. And so actually, he's, he and he and David have, have arranged this signal to let him know whether it's safe or not. He says, I'm going to go out to the field. You stay in this field. I'm going to shoot some arrows. And when I shoot them, if I tell the servant boy that the arrows, you know, there's a rock here. If I shoot them and the arrows, I tell him that the arrows land in front of the rock, that means that it's safe. But if I tell him that the arrows have gone far beyond you, that means that it's not safe. Okay, that your life is threatened. And see, the whole thing about this is that with, with David, he has to completely trust Jonathan for his protection. Because it's Jonathan's word. Jonathan is the one that's going to tell him where it's safe or not. Because he knows if I go back in the household, that household again, and it's not safe for me, probably this time, you know, he's escaped a couple of times, this time I'll be a dead man. So what we see here is that Jonathan, he acts as a friend to protect him. To protect him. You know, when you think about friendship in this world nowadays, there are a lot of things that will threaten you. You know, it's not easy for us to follow Christ in this day and age. There are many things that keep us from Jesus. And you know, we're told in 1 John 2, it says that, it's the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the craveful sin, sin uh, um, and the pride of life. There, there are things out there that want to tempt you and to get you from following Jesus. Okay? In Ephesians, we're also told that we face a spiritual battle. Okay? It says that the devil's out there with his schemes to try and get you. He's there to attack you. It says that the the battle that we face, sometimes we don't see it. Now remember last week, we talked about how two are better than one. You know, remember the suspenders and the cord of three strands is not easily broken. You know, the idea is that when you're in battle and you're facing something that's stronger than you, it's good to have someone watching your back. See, to understand what friendship is and, and what, why we need friends, is we need friends to protect us. Because there's sometimes there's things in life that we don't see. That we don't know what's happening. And a good friend is going to tell you if there's danger ahead. Okay? Sometimes we, 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 we need to be uh, alert. And we, you know, to be a good friend to someone, sometimes if we see a friend and we see, hey, you're going around the wrong path, the relationship that you're in, that's not, that's not a, going to be a healthy or good one for you. 
or hey, you know, you, you keep on telling me that you're caught up, you know, that you're struggling, you know, with sexual purity or something. Hey, you know, we need to get some help to help you. Like I know some guys that if they had trouble, they said, okay, you know, um, I have this program that will actually even tell you uh, what websites I've been to and stuff like that. Okay. Or if you're someone that you're not making good business decisions, you need someone to tell you straight up, hey, that's not good for you. Or um, maybe you're, you're someone that's, uh, you, or maybe you see someone struggling with deep emotional problems, and you say like, hey, hey bro, you know, you really need to go and talk to someone. You need help. You know, I, I'm here to help you. See, that's what friendship is. We can't just be there, be a yes person to everyone. If we want to be a true friend to someone, you've got to protect them. Protect them from the dangers. Okay? Give them warning. Okay? So, sometimes you've got to be like this, okay? Um, you've got to be like the aluminum foil for your friends, right? Because you can put stuff in the oven, but it's wrapped up with that. It protects it from the heat. It's protective. It's kind of like armor. Right? You don't want, to, don't want to make armor out of it, but, but actually it does a lot of good. Just aluminum foil. I think I'm reminded that on the, on the lunar lander they, they used, you know, foil, better stuff than this, but they use that to protect certain parts of it. Okay, then the next thing that you see here, let's moving on here, see. Okay, actually, this is a medallion. This is a, a German medallion, but actually, the, the statement in German, it just says, the person is saying there, this is actually representative of, of friendship. It says that, you know, whatever you, um, whatever it pleases you, I will do. So the idea and concept was that Jonathan was saying, was saying okay, I'm going to do something, whatever it takes to protect you. Okay, moving on, last one here. It says, the risk of a friendship. The risk of friendship. So finally, we, we move to the story and we, we, we get to the point where um, after... Um, so David and Jonathan, as they're, as they're talking about that, he says, are you going to protect me or not? You know, you're going to find out what's going on. He says, um, Jonathan tells to David, by the Lord God of Israel, I will surely sound up my father by this time and day after tomorrow. If he's favorably disposed toward you, I will, not, uh, will I not send you word and let you know? But if my father is inclined to you, may the Lord deal with me ever severely if I do not let you know and send you away safely. May the Lord be with you as been with my father. But let me, uh, but show me unkind fellness, so that, uh, uh, unfailing kindness like that of the Lord as long as you live so that I may not be killed. And do not ever cut off my kindness for my family, not even when the Lord has cut off every one of David's enemies from the face of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, May the Lord call David's enemies to account. And Jonathan and David reaffirmed his oath out of love for him because he loved him as he loved himself. Now the, what, the thing is, what we see is that there's, with friendship, there's also risk involved. There's risk involved. So Jonathan says, I'm going to sound out and find out my, if my father you know, is angry at you or not. My father wants to kill you or not. Now remember, like I said, there's that this puts Jonathan at risk. Because if he does that, and he knows that his father, his father's already given him orders to kill him. So if he's standing, and um, he knows that his father has thrown a spear at David. And so, there's a risk there. You know, when you have a person who's angry, that's got a loaded weapon there, and you're sitting at the dinner table, and you're trying to defend your friend whom he hates, wants to kill, there's an opportunity that you might get shot too. Okay, a little bit of table rage here. So, actually we see when, when actually Jonathan does speak up, actually his father throws a spear at him. Okay? Nice family dinner there. And, um, but more than here, what you see also is that, that he's telling him, hey David, I need you to, there, there's a risk involved for me with this covenant. So, my, my, my life's at risk too. My future's at risk. But also he's saying here, look at, um, when you become king, show kindness to my family. Because in those days, what would happen when, when the new person became king? What would go on if, um, if, that, I, if I became the new king and, and then the, the, the family of the previous king? Okay, because there's a possibility they might overthrow me by a military coup. So the way to eliminate that is I would kill off all the relatives. 
of my enemy. That's what I would do. I, I would eliminate them. That was standard practice. That's how you did, did business in those days. So Jonathan knows that, David, when you become king, you have every right, and this is what happened, you will kill all my family. Because they could rebel and then become king. Because people who were loyal to, the, to the, my father's family before, they might want us back on the throne. So he tells them, don't cut off my family and all. So the thing is, you see, and understanding that true friendship is risky. True friendship is risky. You know, when you think about being really friends with someone, it means that you're sharing things with them that if they were made public, would probably put you in jail or um, at the least cause you severe shame or embarrassment. Because none of us is perfect. And with real friends, they kind of know about you. They know who you are. You know, because when we talk about, oh, well, I want to have real friends, it means that you want to be authentic with someone. You want to be transparent with them. See? Kind of like the saran wrap here. Yeah. You, 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 you know, true friendship is that I, I know about you. I know the things about you, and I still choose to love you and accept you. Yeah. Now, it doesn't mean, though, okay, if you're struggling in this area in, a, in this way, stay that way. No. True friendship says, I, I love you, I care about you, but I, I care about you so much, I don't want you to stay in an unhealthy condition. I want you to grow. You know, actually it's like, let's grow together. You know, we, that, that's the idea. We want to grow and mature to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Okay. Kind of finally, the last thing to talk about is that there's also sacrifice involved with friendship. Sacrifice involved in friendship. Yeah, and the worship team come up as we close here. And so ultimately what happens at the end of the, uh, at the, end of the story is that, um, you'll have to read the rest of it, is that actually when, when Jonathan finds out that, that uh, his father wants to kill David, you know, he goes out to the field, he shoots the arrows, you know, gives him the signal that, hey, it's not going to be safe to get, come back here anymore. And it says that they actually have to depart. Their, their, their friendship, or at, at least, not their friendship, but, but being, being connected to each other, talking to each other, that's going to end. Because he knows that David cannot come anywhere near his household or be there. His father will find out. And we see as we look later on in the story of David that David is running for his life, hiding in caves in the hills to, to escape death. There's a price on his head. So there was a sacrifice for them. But understanding this, that what they were doing, what, what Jonathan was doing, he, he said, I'm doing what's best for my friend. My friendship isn't about me. It's not what I'm getting out of it. It's for the benefit of David. Right? So I just want to, as, as, as we end here, I want you to just think about for yourself about what kind of friend that you will be or how to strengthen your friendships with others. To make that, that the, the commitment, the covenant with people, to uh, protect your friends, look out for them, and take risks to be authentic.